Um, so I've already spoken about how, uh, how much Dean has influenced my life, but uh, you may be interested to know that The Alcoholic is not the only book in the Tawari household that, is, uh, that is, has been a very profoundly important to my family. Uh, my seven-year-old son is an avid reader. Uh, it's one of his favorite things to do in life, is to read both comics and, uh, and literature. And uh, he started reading about three or four years ago, and one of the books that was very instrumental in encouraging to, him to read uh, was a book called Mo and Joe, Fighting Together Forever, <laughs> co-created by Ian Astral. Uh, the book is about a brother and sister team who, uh, who love each other very dearly but fight all the time. And Cuppy learned to read this book by reading it to his then three-year-old sister. Uh, as a dad, to watch my son figure words out and learn how to read through comics, and to do that with his little sister through a book about brotherhood and sisterhood is a really precious memory. So thank you doubly, Dino. Um, but Dean Haspiel is an artist, uh, a writer and an artist who I have an incredible amount of respect and envy for, really. Uh, he's worked on so many uh, major titles that, that are beloved to me, Batman, Spider-Man, The Fantastic Four, um, but also, he, he, as you all know, is a pioneer of the indie comic scene, and his personal creations work like Billy Dogma, characters that have, what I guess I said before, characters with deep humanism and pathos. Um, they, they've had a profound uh, impact on, on me over the years. Um, Dean has also been a close collaborator with the great Hardy Picar on American Splendor and Twitter. He is the founder of the Activate Web Comics Collective and the Trip City Comics Art Lit Salon, an Emmy Award winner for his work on HBO's Board to Death, created and written with Jonathan Ames, with whom he co-created The Alcoholic. Um, and most recently, Dean is spending a lot of his time working on a character called the Red Hook. Um, for those of you who are not New York natives, uh, the Red Hook, is a, Red Hook is an area in New York City, and basically what Dean did there is he took uh, my beloved New York and, and all the, the, the foibles and the bad things about New York and the good things about New York and wrapped it into a character that really turned our city uh, into a flawed but, but heroic hero. Uh, it's genius. Wish that I had thought of it myself. <laughs> um, there was a time when I would close this introduction by saying that I love this guy more than he knows, but I suspect at this point the whole goddamn comic industry is. <laughs> so I'm going to welcome to the stage Dean Haskell for a big hug and a round of applause. that most of us can relate to 
as mutual comics, makers and movers and shakers, struggling to keep the lights on no matter where we go. I think Mark wanted me to talk a little bit about that. I'm currently wrapping up the first season of a free weekly webcomic I produced called The Red Hook for LionWebtoons.com. It's a superhero story that's partially about a sentient Brooklyn whose heart gets broken by an indifferent yet entitled society. Brooklyn decides to literally and physically secede from New York to go back to days of old where society bartered their skills and talents for food and services and communities had each other's back. A new Brooklyn is born where a sketch can get you a drink and a painting and buy you a house. Christopher Calloway of Nerd the Word interviewed me about my project and asked, quote, Brooklyn having a broken heart and becoming an island unto itself is an analogy for undergoing a cultural change. Artists are losing their studios as the neighborhood becomes more gentrified. How are you and your fellow artists living in the, the area coping with the change? Here's a version of my answer. <laughs> Our family is breaking up. As independent freelancers, there's nothing we can do. What was once $25 per square foot a few years ago has become $45 per square foot if you're lucky. Most of us are moving back into our one bedroom apartments. The communities and studios are dissolving. Anxieties are high and spirits are low. There's chatter of some freelancers making an exit to the mountains or to affordable states, but nothing organized. I'm emotionally tethered by the fact that I'm a native New Yorker and it's the only place I've ever lived in. When some people think about New York City, they think of the Empire State Building, Times Square, and Broadway Theater. When I think about New York City, I think about the outliers who fuel the heart and energize the soul of New York City. But as evidenced by abnormal rent hikes, land developers don't care about grassroots culture. New York City is no longer interested in underwriting the avant-garde or affordable space. I was having lunch with my friend and sometimes collaborator, writer, and television producer, Jonathan Andrews. And he agreed that art in New York City was compromised more than ever before. The wild stuff he performed and curated years ago at now defunct basements and second floor venues would be tough to engender today because who goes anywhere anymore when everyone is glued to their smartphone and tablet? It's hard to compete with an audience they can't extricate themselves from the internet for a couple hours to experience something live and direct with carbon dioxide. Our surveillance society has created attention deficit disorder zombies. The scene got taken hostage by the screen. I grew up during a time when artists could live most anywhere in the city, and I counted on the fact that there were going to be places for me to lay down my head so I too could take art seriously. My mother was a deputy director for the New York State Council of the Arts for 30 years. Through her, I got to witness diverse artists, performers, and organizers of all measures do what they did and get by. It was that kind of leeway that encouraged me to sacrifice a normal life for the risk of a freelance one. So as to create cool and exciting new ideas with like-minded artists, necessary to the growth and strength of our culture. What used to be less than the desirable neighborhoods where artists could find a cheap spot to experiment and squeak by, hardly exist anymore. We made scary places cool enough to price us out. For the first time in my life, I'm thinking about being in New York City, but I'm having a mental block in taking that leap of faith. Maybe I should look into the food truck model, I could become a roving cartoonist on Route 66, performing my stories and selling my comics through a concession window. The price of gas might be cheaper than old, windowless warehouse rooms stacked between a garbage dump and daily drug busts. Anyway, my rant got some attention from fellow artists across the nation and across our industry. But you can easily replace their play with most cartoonists who have dedicated 20 to 50 years 
years or more of their life and service to help evolve our industry and perpetuate franchise characters only to lose work because they didn't train anymore in a business that doesn't provide the proper pension. I think there's no guarantee in comics, but in the eternal words of Chris Orr, give a cripple crap a crutch. <laughs> <laughs> Come September 30th, at the end of this month, after many years sitting in the same room, inches from my peers, creating comics and art under the banner of hang dice and needles, we will say our goodbye. Some of us are going to go back to home or to start new lives while others are sparking new studios, smaller studios, and more expensive spaces far away. I'm giving myself a year to see how it all shakes out. I'm 49 years old and I still feel the same tingle I felt when I was a skinny little boy every week new comics came out. I remember getting a 50 cent weekly allowance from my parents and waiting at the newsstand on my corner for the clerk to rack the new comic books so I could be the first kid on my block to see what came out. To ogle the new covers and spy the new stories. Very quickly, 50 cents wasn't enough money to buy what I wanted especially when they raised the price from 20 cents to 25 cents. <laughs> Soon my parents stopped giving me an allowance when they saw what I spent it on, which brought me the comics I wanted until I discovered the Holy Grail. West Side Comics, a local comic book store. It's only I could buy back issues and collections, and that meant I had to get a job. <laughs> and at age 15, I got a job at my local candy and cigar store that paid me $2 an hour so I could buy more comics. <laughs> Old comics. I met my first real-life cartoonist when a regular customer, a short, unassuming Japanese-American man, came in with a portfolio, and I asked him what was in it. He pulled out original art from Prince Valiant and Dandi that he was lettering, and his name was Ben Oda. Suddenly, comics became humanized and were much more than the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Batman, and something called Star Wars before the movie came out. Real people made these things. I started to recognize names and follow my favorite creators. Later on, I discovered Chester Brown's Yummy Fur and Harvey Picard's American Splendor and learned that comics can be about anything. And with that, I decided I was going to be a comic book creator no matter what. But how? Instead of paying attention to science and math, I drew crazy clowns and giant squids attacking battleships in the corners of my junior high school books. I came up with a Shakespeare super team led by Mercutio, Tibble, and Iago. <laughs> by putting my stuff out there in class, I discovered other comic book fans, and we soon became friends. We hung out after school and formed a comic book company where we created new characters and sometimes collaborated and would Xerox and staple our comics to make them feel real. A couple years later, I befriended a kid in high school named Larry O'Neill, who turned out to be Danny O'Neill's son. Danny O'Neill, the legendary comic book writer and editor of Batman, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, Iron Man, Daredevil, Moon Knight, and so much more. Then he got the win that Howard Chapin, the guy who drew that Star Wars comic, needed a new assistant for his magnum opus, American Flag. Another artist down the hall named Bill Sienkiewicz wanted someone to help him out on New Mutants and Electra Assassin. When Walter Simonson got a look at what we could do, he put us to work on Thor. That was 1985. I was 17, going on 18. That was 31 years ago. I never went to a comic book convention until the mid-1990s when my high school pal and cartoonist Josh Neufeld convinced me to fly to Chicago and promote our first two-man comic book anthology titled Keyhole. That's where I met Jessica Abel, Harlan Ellison, and John Byrne. What a trifecta of diverse talents. <laughs> Needless to say, I got bitten by the Comic-Con bug, even though I never got to meet my hero. Jack Kirby, to shake his hand and say, thank you. Something I regret to this day. 
And even if my portfolio wasn't ready for prime time, my peers, and more importantly, comics didn't let me know that. When I got wind of an expo in Bethesda, Maryland called SPX, the Small Press Expo. I found my tribe at SPX, inclusive, innovative, and fucking the system while reinventing it. That's why I befriended the likes of Jess Smith, Dennis Schutz, Bob Shrek, James Pacholka, Evan Dorkin, Roger Langers, Pete Sikandarner, Joan Riley, Brett Warnock, Chris Soros, Greg Bennett, Chris Orr, Warren Menard, and got an authentic fist pump from Will Eisner as he shouted, You're a part of the future, kid! <laughs> SPX was my first home away from home. On Tuesday, September 11, 2001, the worst attack on American soil occurred when terrorists flew airplanes in several of our most prominent buildings, murdering over 3,000 people. If I remember correctly, SPX was supposed to happen that very weekend and was canceled for obvious reasons. Soon after, a man named Mark Nathan reached out to SPX and to all the exhibitors who were supposed to attend and gave them a free room at Baltimore Comic Con that very Halloween. The first time I met Mark Nathan, I recognized him in the hotel bathroom and hugged him before I even shook his hand. <laughs> Somehow I fooled Mark and Brad Tree into inviting me back as a guest every year since, treating <laughs> me like I was special for no good reason but because they say so. Two years ago, when my studio was Seth Kushner had a bad run with cancer. Mark came up to my table with a blank check and asked, how do you spell Seth's last name? I told him, and Mark proceeded to write a check to Seth for $10,000 and said to me, please make sure Seth and his family get this money so they can have food and fruit and vegetables. Baltimore Comic Con is another home away from home and generally celebrates and takes care of its cartoonists. Baltimore Comic Con is where I met Ramona Frazier, Martin Modell, Nick Cardi, Herb Trent, Jerry Robinson, Sally Semmer, Gene Coleman, Joe Kubert, Jules Pfeiffer, Joe Rubenstein, George Perez, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, Ron Wilson, mm -hmm. Stan Lee, and Michael Ringo. It was Baltimore Comic Con 2007 that writer Mark Gray and I commiserated about the then recent passing of one of his greatest collectors, Mike Lorengo, and promised that we wouldn't just talk about doing something together like we promised the previous years. We'd make it happen because we never know. Seven years later, we made good on our promise collaborating on the box for Archie Comics, the box in which I convinced Darwin Cook to do a cover for. Another talent, like no other, taken away from us far too soon. I first discovered North Carolina cartoonist David Trustman while perusing Artist Alley at Baltimore Comic Con a few years ago with my studio mate, Krista Bassano. I told her my favorite thing to do at Comic Cons is to discover those diamonds in the rough, the grassroots efforts of outliers. We were unprepared for David Trustman's self-published comics which has the single most shocking, yet absurd, images I've ever seen. We're talking pure, unexpurgated comics. We became friends and just recently started collaborating on a free webcomic called Got Slapped. This is the kind of beautiful thing that can only happen when you curate a room that allows rookies and veterans to mesh with retailers and cosplayers and publishers and editors a full-blown nerd Mardi Gras. <laughs> Whenever someone asks me, how do I let people know about my comics? I always say, show up to your own party. Your party is my party, it's our party. Make yourself available. Be open to anything and everything, and comics will give you back something profound and unexpected. Comics have come a long way since I picked up a copy of Shazam No. 1 off the newsstand in 1973. The borderline between mainstream and independent comics have blurred substantially. Batman, Superman, The Avengers, Jessica Jones, and Wonder Woman can share the same space with Mother Rockets, The Walking Dead, Fun Home, March, and the story of my tits. <laughs> 
How is it going up? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Comics have become more diverse in substance and talent as print dupes it out of digital. The New York Times and most all major news outposts have broken the levy between socially acceptable and critically inclined, expanding the readership and shifting the dialogue. Fans have become more involved and, dare I say, entitled. <laughs> and in order to make comics, it seems that you don't ever have to have read a comic, but I highly recommend studying the form and knowing its history. We now have universities and how-to books that can give anyone and my mother a leg up on sequential narrative arts. But is comics a smart career choice? A good way to spend the majority of your life? There's a profound scene in the American Splendor movie where Harvey Picard, played by Paul, Paul Giamatti, is sleeping in bed and suddenly wakes up with an apparent nightmare. Terrified, he looks around and says, I got a job. I got a job and it quells his fear. Every night I go to sleep, I have a panic attack, and I think about the career I chose, and the life I live, and wonder what's going to happen. What will tomorrow bring? Will I get more work? Is this where it stops? I remind myself that no one put a gun to my head and forced me to make comics, but I worry so much about comics that I can't breathe, and I start to choke and jump out of bed suffocating. I pace around my apartment in the dark until I calm myself down and lay back in bed. Eventually, I pass out. I don't go to sleep, I pass out. The only thing that lets me sleep for a few hours at a time, the thing that quells my anxiety is the fact that I'm not alone, that I have this family, that I have all of you, we are not breaking up. We're not going away. That some of you are wide awake when I'm fighting sleep too. And like me, the majority of the people who make up the comics community are there because they have to be. Once in a while, I wake up in the middle of the night and I think about you and I say,